Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This is the mid-July edition, July 14th specifically. We're hitting the triple digits here in Texas. That's Fahrenheit, not Celsius. But very thankful we have air conditioning. That helps. Go ahead and hop on in. We've got some good content to cover today. We've got some new modules. Uh, following some recent news buzz, our own Will Vu added a new module targeting F5 big IP devices running a vulnerable traffic management user interface, or TMUI. Vulnerable targets allow for an unauthenticated directory traversal, which this module leverages to upload a shell script and execute it as the root user. It's powerful stuff. I believe we'll have a demo of this. And community contributor Radek Domanski provided a new module targeting Netgear Nighthawk R6700 routers running firmware containing a, UP and, a UPnPD daemon with an exploitable buffer overflow, giving attackers on the LAN side of the router the ability to trigger an unauthenticated reset of the admin password back to the known default value. Chaining this module with the Netgear Telnetable module will pop you a root level shell prompt on the target, ready for your commands. And carrying over a connection from our previous demo meeting, this module is also a product of a own to own competition from a team that includes the module author, who's Radek, and Metasploit contributor Pedro Ribirio, the neat stuff. And we'll have a demo of this. Our own Spencer McIntyre added a new module targeting AnyDesk, which is a commercially sold remote desktop software. Linux and FreeBSD versions of AnyDesk prior to 5.5.3 contain a format string vulnerability that is remotely exploitable within the AnyDesk GUI. Spencer's new module exploits this phone to get remote code execution on the target. No authentication required. And we'll have a demo of this as well. Community contributor Kabbalah Security provided a new module targeting ATutor, which is an open source web-based learning content management system. Vulnerable versions of ATutor allow for directory traversal by an authenticated user, which this new module takes advantage of to upload a payload and execute. And we will have a demo of this as well. Uh, contributor Kabbalah Security also provided another module uh, this time around, uh, this one targeting Bolt, which is an open source content management system. Some versions of Bolt, including 3.7.0 and possibly 3.6, contain a handful of vulnerabilities, which this new module takes advantage of to get authenticated remote code execution on the target. Nice stuff. And in the vein of modules which leverage multiple vulnerabilities on the target, community contributor EGX added a new module targeting vulnerable versions of OpenSys, which is an open source student information system. For vulnerable targets, the module exploits an access control vuln to access scripts, which normally would only be accessible to authenticated users, then uses a local file inclusion to reach a SQL injection vulnerability, leading to execution of arbitrary PHP code via unsafe use of the eval function. Neat stuff. Community contributor Comproot added a new scanner module for 40 male targets, which detects if an authentication bypass vulnerability is present. And community contributor RootUp provided a new AUX module targeting Spring Cloud Config Server, which is software that provides externalized configuration in a distrib distributed system. For vulnerable targets, this new module will allow an attacker to download arbitrary files, no authentication required. A grid list of modules there, appreciate those contributions. Uh, and other valuable work going on uh, within framework, our own Adam Galway added a new MSF console command named debug. Running this new command will output a bunch of relevant and often requested by us data when analyzing a problem reported by a framework user, which can then be easily copy pasted into a GitHub issue. Help, helping us help you help us, if you will. And we'll have a demo of this. And our own Grant Wilcox added a new service name command line option to MSF Venom, supporting creation of x86 and x64 exe service payloads with arbitrary service names. So nice addition there. Community contributor Pedrib improved three IBM data risk manager modules uh, that Pedrib had authored a few months back. Swinging back through and updating module documentation and references with vendor confirmed vulnerable versions and links to vendor advisory that had come out since the modules had been published. So really appreciate this eye for detail, Pedrib. Thank you. And rounding out our list today, there are a couple of enhancements from our own Alan Foster. First is an update Alan made to the auto check mix in to use module prepend instead of module include helping improve the developer experience there. Alan also added the force exploit advanced option, allowing user override of the module's check result. Good stuff. And secondly, Alan added a helpful hint to the search out command output, informing the user that they can utilize the use command to easily select an item 
from the list that the search output provided. So good stuff. And a few bug fixes. We love the bug fixes. Uh, community contributor Tim Wright added a few fixes for the Java interpreter related to the use of standard error. So I appreciate that. Community contributor Akuman added a fix which allows use of the MSF WS JSON RPC API token environment variable with the Metasploit JSON RPC web service when a database is connected. Handy. And community contributor Kavala Security swung back through and updated their own module contribution by fixing an error in the new ATutor module we mentioned previously, uh, which occurs when running a tutor file manager traversal exploit with without creds. And uh, Kavala Security also cleaned up some code. So really appreciate that. And as always, we have details on recent framework activity at uh, blog.rabbit7.com where we post our weekly Metasploit wrap ups. Um, swing by through every Friday, we will have a new post up. And we really appreciate all of y'all who help make Metasploit better through your contributions to the framework project. It makes things better. Thank you. And with that, time for demos. We'll kick this off with the, the cool Netgear unauthenticated uh, admin res password reset from the LAN side leading to remote code execution. Um, I think we'll hand it over to Grant. You, you there, sir? Perfect. I'll start it up here. All right. Yeah, so sorry if the text is a little bit smaller than this. I had to capture the whole entire screen. Uh, so basically what we're doing here is logging in with the default admin password. We can see that the firmware version is a vulnerable version. This is the last vulnerable version of this firmware on the target. So we're just checking to see, okay, basically 192.168.1.1 is a vulnerable target. We're then going to load up the module. So this is an auxiliary module, but it does lead to RCE. It just requires an additional module. So that's why we've put it as an auxiliary module because it doesn't directly gain RCE, but it does lead to RCE with the extra module that we have in the framework. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set up the R hosts and double check. So we're just gonna run the check command. We can see that grabs the firmware version of the target router and confirms that it is indeed vulnerable. And then we're just gonna go ahead and exploit the target. So the exploit will reset the router back to its default credentials of admin and password. Um, now, in our example, this was already set, but in theory, it would be whatever password you set. Um, so it's just gonna reset it back to that factory default. Um, to then gain RCE, we will follow the directions listed below. Um, and that essentially involves logging back into the router, as we'll do now. I just drag it over the screen um, and we'll log back in with the credentials admin password. We then need to go ahead and change the uh, password that's been reset. Unfortunately, if you have the default password, it won't allow you to enable Telnet. So we're just gonna go ahead and fill out the credentials here. We're just gonna change it to something simple, password one, two, three in this case. And then just hit apply, and we're gonna go ahead and just confirm the other settings, so long. And just close this down because we don't really need to log back in again. And then we're going to go ahead and load up the Telnet enable module. So this will basically enable the Telnet uh, daemon on the target router. It does, however, require a couple of settings here. So we do need to specify the interface. Um, in my experience, we also needed to specify the MAC address and the timeout. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and set that so on. We also need to provide the username and password of the admin user on the router. So that was part of what we did with the logging back in. We changed it to a non-default uh, password so that we could actually run this module successfully. And after just doing a couple of things to set the timeout in the Mac here, we should be able to run this module. So we'll just finish typing those in bits of information in. Run the exploit, and you can see we logged in successfully. We're sending the packets to enable the telnet. We now got a shell. 
we do have to log back in again. So we're just gonna type the admin user name and password again so that we log in. And if we now check our information, we'll see that we're the root user and we can just double check this with the U name and see that we are in fact running on the router itself. Neat. Thanks, Grant. All right. All right. And let's see. How about a demo of any desk, uh, specifically Linux client, remote code execution? Spencer, you on the line? Yes, I am. Awesome. I'm going to fire it up here. All right. You're All right. Ready. Thanks. This is going to be a quick one. Uh, so this CVE exploits a remote uh, unauthenticated vulnerability and a uh, format string in the UI client. Uh, so what we are showing right here is the check method is actually doing a discovery of the AnyDesk protocol, and we're actually able to extract the remote host name out. So in this case, it's the default value of Ubuntu. Uh, when we go ahead and try to actually run this exploit, uh, we again do that remote uh, check. So that way we can get the host name, but we're also validating the operating system, which is included within that discovery phase. Um, now, yeah, <laughs> thanks for running this again. The actual process was pretty quick. Um, in running this, um, you didn't actually notice, but after running the exploit, there was about a five second delay. And what's kind of interesting about this vulnerability is that it's within the client user interface, but the vector is actually a message that's sent from the service to the client. Um, which is why the client UI does have to be running at the time. And that's why there's that little delay there. We have to wait for the GUI uh, to go ahead and refresh. Um, that then results in code execution as the user that is running the UI, which is why we can see there that we're unfortunately not running as root, but we do have an interpreter running in memory. Thank you. Super cool. Spencer, do you have any idea how popular this software is? It looks like it's made by a, a German company it's, and it is commercial software. Um, I haven't seen it in the wild. Um, it seems pretty cool, though. Um, but uh, no, I, I'm not entirely sure how popular it is. OK, cool. Yeah, it looks like they support a lot of platforms from their website uh, as clients. Uh, neat. Thanks for the demo. All right. And how about an ATutor RCE demo from our own Shelby Pace? Shelby, online? Yep. Cool. All right, you are go. Yeah, uh, so this module exploits uh, ATutor, uh, which is this web-based uh, learning CMS. Um, so basically what it does is it exploits a directory traversal vulnerability uh, after authentication to uh, upload a payload. And uh, yeah, basically request that payload and get execution on the server. Uh, so so the, uh, the module description, I believe, uh, originally listed just the version 2.24 as being vulnerable, but actually I managed to get uh, this module working on 2.2.1 as well. I'm sure that the versions between those two versions probably are vulnerable as well. Um, yeah, as I said previously, this does require authentication though, but then you get a shell as the uh, user uh, running server. Neat. Thanks, Shelby. All right. Big IP leading to RCE. Uh, Will, you on the line? Yep. Yep. Can you hear me? Awesome. I can hear you just fine, right. sir. You ready? Ready for me to hit the go yeah, button? So, uh, yeah, you can play it. Um, the right. uh, F5 Big IP um, has a directory traversal in it uh, that allows you to access certain URIs unrestricted without authentication. Um, some of those URIs allow for both um, file upload as well as uh, command execution in a restricted management shell called TMSH. Um, this whole UI component is called uh, TMUI, which is just a traffic management user interface, if I recall correctly. So, um, what the module does here is that it uses a directory traversal to um, to access the file upload page and then upload a uh, a, um, a shell a shell script, 
which contains commands that allow you to run, you know, whatever Unix commands you, you want. Um, uh, either an arch command payload, so just a normal use command payload, or a stager to upload and execute a meterpreter. And um, so the module here, uh, it, it uploads that first, and then it uses the directory traversal once again to call the TMSH functionality that lets you create an alias, which is one of the allowed commands, or only, I think, four allowed commands. I think create, delete, modify, and list. Um, it re-aliases the list command, which is allowed to the create, or sorry, to the bash command. Um, and then it uses the create command to create an alias um, for list to bash, and then it calls list as bash on the shell script that you've uploaded, therefore bypassing the the, the, the list and uh, allows you to obtain remote code execution in full as the Unix user, which is root in this case. So it is a privileged exploit. And uh, yeah, there's not a lot to it. Uh, it might be a little finicky at first, but that's mostly because I think that when you install it, you have to log in as admin and everything, just do the normal admin stuff. Um, it needs to have um, I don't think it needs to have a session or anything. It just needs to be fully set up. Um, you can't just install it out of the box and, and then it'll work. Cause, I don't know, it's enterprise software. It needs a little bit more um, more work involved. So, but otherwise, it works pretty good. Yep. Yeah, that's super cool. Thank you, Will. And we'll learn more about that new debug command we talked about a minute ago. From our own Adam Galway. If you can't hear the audio, let me know. I'm going to start it here. It should, the audio should come through now. I've recently been making changes to Metasploit to improve the quality of information we get uh, whenever people open up issues. One of them is an improvement of the issue templates. Uh, another is the introduction of the debug command, as can be seen here. Uh, the point of the debug command is that whenever uh, a user encounters an error with framework, um, they can start a new session, uh, recreate all the steps which led to the error, and then just run debug with no arguments. This will print out uh, all the different fields that these flags dictate and will print it out in a format which is ready, uh, already in Markdown, so you can just dump it in the issue template and it'll, uh, the, sorry, the new issue, and it will merge really well. It also uh, collapses things into sections so that it's, um, it doesn't clutter up the new issue as much. Uh, there's five sections. Inside the debug command, uh, running different flags will allow you to print certain sections. Uh, C will give you the history of all the commands in your current session up to a total of the last 50 commands. And uh, E will go into the framework.log file and using a regex will pull out the last 10 errors which occur. Uh, you can't see here, but that also includes stack traces, which may be accompanying an error. Uh, background for this ticket as well, we also re overhauled how errors are logged to be more consistent. So that should hopefully provide us with more information in the future. Debug L uh, is relatively simple, just dumps out the last 50 lines of the log file, the framework.log file. There is some overlap between error logs and, uh, sorry, there is some overlap between the error flag and the log flag but this is just to ensure that there is no information that you're missing. Uh, data store is a little bit more complex. Data store will give you all the information about a user's current setup. Uh, as you can see here, uh, I'm using the local DB and we filtered out some information on database information uh, purely because we want to make sure that if someone's using a remote HTTP uh, connection with a database, uh, they're not accidentally uploading anything sensitive. We have put this warning up here telling people to remove sensitive information, but this is just to make absolutely sure that no one does. Um, the useful thing with the D flag or the data store information is that if you use a module and then set a variable, uh, debug D will reflect that. So it will show the current active module and it will also show all the variables currently in use. Um, the format that this information is put out in allows you to directly copy information inside this foldable section and paste it into uh, the developers or whoever's assigned to the issue tickets 
they can paste it into the config file located in their .msf4 folder. That means that allows them to sort of automatically copy the other user's environment. Obviously, they'd have to make sure not to overwrite with this filtered information. But um, if the issue has something to do with the database, then they can follow up with the user manually. And finally is the versions flag. Versions flag is relatively simple. It just pulls out information on the framework version, the Ruby version, their install route, uh, the path in which it's installed, uh, the session type, like the actual type of connection the user has, and the install method. Um, the install method at the moment can only categorically say whether or not you've installed through Omnibus or through Git. Uh, Arch and Linux were ones we attempted, but it was sort of, we found that it was a bit too loose and not as easy to differentiate between the two as much as we wanted. So for those cases, whenever we can't tell if it's, sorry, whenever an install isn't a Git clone or an Omnibus, we simply say other, please specify. And if it's pertinent, uh, people can ask the user to specify said information. And uh, yeah, that's debug. Super cool. Any, uh, we actually have Adam on the line here. Any, any questions for Adam about that? Uh, I just wanted to add on top of that, that we're eventually going to put in to the issue template that people should use the debug command before opening an issue, but we're just waiting until it's been a master for two weeks now, these changes. We're just waiting for it to spread out to the majority of users so that it can actually be usable. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Neat. Thanks, Adam. All right. In attacker KB or attacker knowledge base. Hacker data at community scale um, is a great place to share knowledge and opinions around bones and um, why they're hot or why they're not, why they're valuable, why they're not. Um, no demos this week, but we I'm going to hand it over to James. He's going to give you give an uh, update kind of on, on things that have been going on related to Attacker KB. And hopefully, James, you're on the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, are. I'm here. Uh, okay, cool. All right, man. All, I, uh, all yours, man. Yeah, so uh, we don't have anything visible to show. Uh, most of the stuff that we've been working on has been bug fixes that aren't exactly user facing. Like one of the things we fixed is a panic that was found that was causing the site to go down when uh, a certain race condition was triggered. Um, there's some lo uh, analytics logging bugs that we hit, um, some changes to uh, our user model and like how we interact with that in code. It's a lot of back end stuff that's not uh, immediately user facing. Um, so that, that's all been landed and deployed kind of in the background that people uh, haven't really seen, but we have been pushing code changes. Um, but we, as far as like new work we're doing, we are doing some major rework, re-architectures on some of our bigger um, features. One of them is references. So uh, like the references that you see on a topic, right now they're just stored in metadata, which is a JSON field in the topic. And that, uh, it works fine because it's very flexible, but it's not uh, really easy to do a lot more uh, complex uh, actions with. So we are currently re-architecting that to be its own model and sort in the database separately. And this will allow us to do things like categorize references and add user, allow users to add a reference without um, creating an assessment um, and uh, also give us better searching on uh, like canonical references like CVE ID or like maybe a security advisory. So those will be more first class citizens. So those can be searched on uh, more accurately. Uh, we're, these are big, uh, big code changes that we have to make to do this kind of stuff. So um, it's taken a little longer, but we, you know, I think next demo we should have a lot to show. Uh, the other one that we're working on is um, uh, reworking the tag architecture. So like the tags that you see, uh, in assessments and uh, and then that bubble up to the topics. We're reworking how those uh, function so that way we can add more tags easily right now, like the, just to get, you know, AKB up and running quickly. We just made it so every tag was its own database column and that's not really sustainable. So we're moving them out into their own table so that way we can add new tags as we want um, without having to do a big code uh, change and then a redeploy to add new tags. So. Uh, that'll be really nice and also opens us up to some new things that we're excited for with um, uh, we're looking at doing some like community sourcing of tags uh, to help drive some machine learning stuff. So all this is necessary for bigger and better things. It's not super exciting right now, but um, it will be exciting soon. So <laughs> um, I, I did want to call out one other thing that's not really, uh, uh, it's not really a new attacker KB feature, but it's, um, 
it's a community uh, effort that uh, has been really cool. Um, so one of our uh, beta users messaged me a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe about a month ago now, um, saying, hey, I'm a member of this uh, Try Hack Me site. Uh, basically, they're like a tutorial site for learning different, uh, a wide range of security skills. They, they do everything in rooms, uh, and each room is like a walkthrough tutorial. And he's like, hey, you know, it'd be really cool if we could do an Attacker KB room to kind of highlight the benefit that Attacker KB has to the community. Um, so they created this room for highlighting Attacker KB and, and what you can do with it. So um, it kind of just brings knowledge to AKB and shows, you know, one of the ways you could use it. So this one you actually go through and you, they give you a VM to scan and then there's a vulnerability on it. Um, you find that vulnerability, but then you're like, oh, you know, I need to learn more information about this. Is there anything I can do to exploit this and get access to the box? And then from there, once you find that vulnerability, they instruct you on how to look it up through uh, Attacker KB, find more information on it. Um, you know, kind of like it's all walked through uh, and guided. So they tell you exactly what to look for and you answer these questions and you can move on to the next step. And eventually, uh, you know, you use the knowledge gain from Attacker KB by, and the, to find out that there's a module there in Metasploit. So you can use the uh, Metasploit module to actually exploit the vulnerability and get access to the box. So uh, it's been a really cool effort. It's got a lot of good traction uh, and traffic coming to the AKB site. And you can see there's 566 people that have been uh, using it and it's only seven days old. So um, it's really cool and it's all community driven. I just wanted to highlight it and, and show off like, you know, people are excited about this and uh, they're actually like, you know, putting code down to, to show it. So uh, it's really cool. I'm, I hope we see more of this stuff uh, soon. Excellent.